Hello and welcome to this week's Health Tech Hour with me, Steve Roost. Each week we bring you the best news, views and interviews with leaders, clinicians, CEOs, founders, whoever else that are changing the world of UK healthcare and not just UK healthcare, but healthcare across the world. As regular listeners will know and people that interact with the show or, or look across any of the other platforms, I am a CEO and founder of a health tech company myself called PocDoc. PocDoc support the show, and among other things, PocDoc is busy revolutionizing the world of point of care testing and making it as easy as possible to get a healthy heart check, either in a pharmacy or NHS or at home. So if you would like to find out more information, please head to PocDoc.co or get in touch across any of the platforms. Thank you to everyone listening live on the incredible platform that is UK Health Radio, run by the ever effervescent uh, Johan and his team. I almost forgot his name then, which is embarrassing because he's running the sh he's running the sound on the show this week. Um, so Johan, thank you so much for the opportunity and thank you to everyone listening live. Thank you also to everyone who's listening to this after the fact and uh, whether that's on YouTube or on any of the podcast channels. We got some great news this week, really exciting news. The Health Tech Hour is in the top 100 health and medicine podcasts for the UK, which has been amazing. We've been going, you know, just under two years. And obviously, this isn't my only gig. So um, it's a real testament to the guests, the producers, and also to UK Health Radio as well for helping us build the following that we've built. So we're now um, broadcasting to over 50 countries every single month. Um, hello to everybody from Saudi Arabia to Vietnam to, to Colombia to the US and, you know, lots more to come. And obviously, I mention this every time, but it's not just me on UK Health Radio. There are many, many other fantastic presenters and you can get all of their shows on the, on the, um, podcast, on the UK Health Radio podcast channels. So check that out as well. Now, this week, we're taking a very different tack to anything that we've done on the show before. So um, we've got, um, we're going to analyze the personality makeup of a huge number of digital health founders and CEOs. Um, I am actually included in this cohort, so I'm a little bit nervous about having my personality dissected live on air. But as long as I don't come out and the conclusion is like I'm a complete sociopath, I think we'll be, we'll be okay. Um, so joking around, um, or joking aside rather, today's guest is Ian Coyne, who is a partner at Coulter & Partners, which is one of the leading executive search firms in health and life sciences in the UK, uh, who spearheaded the research. So this is a piece of research that they commissioned to try and understand what made particularly digital health CEOs and founders tick. We're going to go into all of the findings. Um, you know, there might be tears maybe from me, I don't know. But we'll go through it all. And Ian um, is actually, apart from being one of the nicest people in the industry, he's also one of the most connected. And his quarterly health tech breakfast clubs are the stuff of legend. So, Ian, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm well. Thanks for having me, Steve. This is a, uh, it's a very hot seat, so I'm very pleased to be here. Good. It's great to have you on the show. So, um, wh what... Let's start with the why. Why Why did you commission this piece of research and what was it and what was behind it? Because it, I, I look, on a personal level, I love, as I'm sure many of the people that took part, I love a bit of introspection. I love learning a bit about myself. Um, but it wasn't, it was quite, you know, it was a surprise to, to, to have the thing drop into the inbox saying, do you want to participate? So what's the backstory? Uh, so I was hoping you wouldn't ask this question because I didn't really have one at the start of this because <laughs> like, like all up, research, <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to, um, so I was curious and there is a bit more to it than that, but I think in, in sort of doing the job we do, so in executive search, you spend a lot of time talking to investors, executives, board members, CEOs, um, and in digital health, invariably the conversations are about doing stuff that's not been done before. So in, in your world, Steve, you know, kind of being able to transform um, clinical pathways through technology is, is a huge benefit to the patient, is a huge benefit to the health system. Um, but it's also really hard. Uh, and I think people that choose to go into this, and um, I'll, I'll turn it back on you in a second, um, I, I was just interested as to why, because someone else you you had in the seat, I think about a year ago, Hakim Yadi um, said to me, 
we were at a conference last year in Rome, and he said, you know, there are there are easier ways of making money than being in health tech. Um, <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> Hakim, always ready with the with the one liner. I like yes. that. Yeah. Um, so um, so it was that curiosity. So that you know, if you think about most other industries, so if you're going to start like a, a Vinted or a Depop or a Monzo Bank, I think the kind of the 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 way you're going to do that and the steps you're going to take are, are pretty well defined. You know, if you're going to start a marketplace, uh, you need to get customers on board. You need to kind of great, build a great product. You need to then kind of get a value proposition, et cetera. Um, I think in health tech, that's, that's, you're never sure about that because you've got all of these stakeholders you've got to manage around health systems and who's going to pay for it and what a pharma think of it and, you know, what, who holds the data. There's all these really complex challenges but then innovative founders still go after it, even though, you know, the chance of failure, I think, compared to a lot of industry, other industries is incredibly high. So I guess I just want to understand, are these kind of these these people like you, Steve, different from the average person that sits in a, a more, um, uh, I say, you know, mundane or predictable C-suite role? Right. And um, yeah, I mean, a lot of that was hopefully we can kind of cheer things up a little bit about, you know, mm. <laughs> the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um and so but why why so the original kind of proposition was are uh, is there something unique around individuals that that seek to found or run early stage or reasonably early stage high growth um healthcare businesses versus their peers in non-healthcare businesses yes and and i think it also the other thing we really want to understand is how do you build teams because that that's how you make great companies you have you know, CEOs and founders are a, such an important internal and external kind of spearhead of the business. Um, but to be successful, you know, in in, in uh, all worlds, you've got to build teams around you. And so the key is, um, you know, how do you kind of complement um, the founder with skills and preferences? And, and that's one important thing before we kind of dissect the, the um, character profile. This is all about how people prefer to work. It's not about people's abilities because, you know, founders have the ability to build teams. Otherwise, we wouldn't have great, uh, you know, huge companies uh, today. But it's about what their natural desire is when they kind of step into this world or in any kind of innovative world. So I think if you can understand founders and CEOs in particular, um, and in, in our world, often we will start working with founders and CEOs as they think about building out their senior team. So, you know, they might need a first chief product officer or chief technology officer or a head of business development to help them kind of get into health systems or um, pharma companies or med tech companies, whatever the kind of route to market is. Um, and having a bit of data around people, I think, is really powerful, even if that's, you know, you can kind of go into all sorts of depths of psychological profiling. But I think even just being able to understand work styles and preferences of how people like to work can really help a team um, go from being you know functional um, to being really high performing I think that would would chime with I mean my you know before my before I was founded Hot Talk, I, you know, I spent the majority if not the vast majority of my career in and around VC tech and startups and things like that so I can certainly relate when we were building Viagogo where we went through phases of having phenomenal individuals involved in the business at all levels and at stages where we really struggled in a number of really key roles and it dramatically held us back and that was a marketplace that was consumer that didn't have any of the any of the issues associated with healthcare that make it potentially more challenging so i can totally relate to that good should we dive into a couple of the results um yeah well yeah let's just you know let's go easy with so are these, are we're gonna do we're gonna do this i just like to emphasize this is generalized results okay this isn't exactly. just my results we're not it gonna is, like not. bear all my dirty laundry over here but so i've got we'll, your report here steve if, if you want yeah. to go no we will not we'll yeah not. exactly no i went through mine with your colleague it was very yes. informative um but just before we do yeah, yeah. this isn't very common is it what, what impressed me about this about what you did was that you're actually trying to deliver something of value back to the industry at all, but also, well, sorry, it delivers value at multiple levels. It has value to the individual. It has value to the individual's company. And it also has value to the industry as a whole. And it was actually something that, I, you know, was it just something that you, did you have, and it seems to have gotten quite a lot of traction from what I can tell. 
And so was that kind of, did you realize it would, it would go like that? Or was that just, you know, part of the happy coincidence? Yeah, I think it because uh, I wanted it to be open source from the start. So obviously not, you know, everyone's data that's taken part is completely confidential. So um, the deal was always take part. You'll get a, a full feedback session from one of our leadership development specialists who can talk you through your profile. Which is uh, excellent, then, by the way. Excellent feedback session. Good, good. I'm glad. I'll, I'll pass <laughs> it on. Um, they're, they're a brilliant team. Um, and so, so that was number one. It is, you know, I think it's quite rare as a, particularly as an early stage CEO, to have that when it's not driven by your investors or, you know, kind of the, um, perhaps the chair. So that was hopefully a good thing. And that was the deal. Say, so look, if you do this, your data goes into this anonymized, anonymized aggregated data set. And then we can use this as a group to kind of understand um, ourselves better. So we published, I think, um, in February when we hit, hit the first 50, uh, five zero. Um, we're hoping to get to about 100 people by the time we get to help in Amsterdam in June and then push on to about 200 by the end of the year, because then I think we can start cutting the data by um, sort of CEOs versus founders. So those that have kind of gone from zero to one and those that have perhaps come in later and, and started to run these businesses, um, but also looking at those that, you know, buy different funding routes. So do the kind of venture backed CEOs look a bit different from the sort of bootstrapped versus the um, right. people that, that went down different routes of partnerships and other things. So, um, yeah, it, it, it was it was always, um, and I think it, it also encourages people to participate because I think compared to any other industry, um, health is is one of the most collaborative industries I've ever worked in, having been in sort of telco think, and, and FM. I think you have to, because it, it's impossible not to. I mean, but every step of the, every step, of the of, of the industry requires you to integrate collaborate there isn't there isn't the ability to end to own things end to end like you might have in other industries you 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 by by virtue of the fact that it's a clinically driven industry you have to collaborate yes yeah and, and the the ecosystem is key because you know to your point you'll you'll work across nhs pharmacies um you know kind of the the, the sort of the segmentation of the nhs even in the uk is is huge and then you look at companies trying to get to the us and that's a whole different kind of ball game of you know splitting payers and providers up and the yeah. role big pharma takes there so um yeah and, and it was it was also to kind of see if there is any commonality in this group and i think the the good news is um there is um and, and also that, yeah, you know, that point around building teams, speaking to sort of the next level down. So GMs and C-suite members, I think they really value being able to see the difference in work styles between them and their, their boss. So they can kind of, mm. those, those gut feel thing, gut feel things you often know in C-suite happening around, you know, um, perhaps sort of execution focus over ideas. There's, there's things you, you know, you probably saw this at Fire Go, go through the different great growth phases. Uh, at times you feel like the, the the team's really performing. At times you feel like actually, you know, the cogs are spinning, but we're not making the traction. And I think a lot of that is down to things like communication style and, you know, leadership style and, and kind of how well people can structure a team yeah, rather I, than just I, lead I, a team. I think people who haven't worked in early stage businesses, particularly I would argue ones that are venture backed probably, because I think bootstrap businesses, you're right, are different. Um, maybe different in a really good way, you know, actually, because they are building viable businesses that can grow. Um, they're not reliant on cheap capital. Um, that's a kind of a topic for another day. The, um, the, um, but, the, you know, I, I do think that those people that haven't worked in those businesses, they underestimate the ability of individuals, whether they're really good or really bad, to impact progress um, and particularly i think you find in healthcare a lot of individuals move from large organizations big pharma big diagnostics providers systems so on across into a smaller startup environment and sometimes that transition can go really really well and sometimes it can go really really badly um, and yeah I, I, that, that is probably due to personality in part or in in, in large part and I think in, in venture, you're right, I think in venture versus bootstrapping, you've got like the clock is ticking. So whenever I see an, like an announcement of a fundraise, it's always a positive thing. You know, the, the, the innovation in health at the moment, despite, you know, probably a not a fantastic year of funding last year, is still incredible. When you look at the sort of the, the, 
data around geno genomics and genetics and, and the capability of that and the actual ability to transform um, the health system. And I know there's there's sort of huge funding challenges around that. That innovation is um, is incredible, but when you put the sort of um, clock of venture capital next to that, I think a lot of things get amplified. So to your point, the sort of speed that you've got to deliver at, the kind of knowing that in 18 months time, you know, you need to be kind of either at, at point B or at least really close to point B to then get some more cash to carry on, you know, and, and does that kind of ramp up? I think it's a real, um, that that can just amplify personality profile in a way that in a you know a more steady business you don't see as much. And what was I? I don't disagree with you at all. What what why why does this study and the outcomes do you think matter? Why does it matter to individuals? Why does it matter to companies? Why does it matter to the industry? And and I guess why does it matter to to you and call to and partners? So I think I'll, I'll go reverse order. I think wherever we can reduce the risk of hiring, you know, the wrong person, that's a good thing because to your point, you can interview, you can reference, you can meet people, you know, four or five times through an interview process and still they don't work out. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's, that's, and I'm sure everyone goes to those processes completely open and completely transparent and trying to make it work. And it, it doesn't. So, I think the most basic level, it's another level of data for us to say, OK, if you're going to and we've just we've just finished off a really um, large CTO search for a drug discovery company. And we use this for the finalist candidates. And the CEO said, look, it's incredibly useful to sort of see my own results and see the CTO's results. So I kind of know what I'm getting and where we're going to be similar and where we're going to be different. Yeah. And it was actually really additive to say, look, I, I know I'm a detailed person. I know I'm. Um, you know, focused on execution, and they're going to be a bit more challenging with me about innovation and driving new ideas through. Mm. Uh, it's probably an oversimplification, but at least you know, okay, so when you get together, they're going to be the areas where perhaps there's a slight degree of un uncomfortableness where you're, you know, you've had a way of working for a long time, and then you're bringing in someone else that's quite new and different. Ha being able to kind of know that and quantify that in in data. Um, I think also when it's data, it's, it's less about the individual because you're kind of saying, look, we're looking at two sets of data here, not you being kind of slightly on the crazy scale when it comes to innovation and me being all trying to shut down your ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I think that's kind of um, uh, the the lowest end. But then I think for the for the industry, everyone I've shown this to. So when I speak to investors, a lot of them kind of nod their heads and perhaps reflect a little bit and say, yeah, this is kind of what we look for. Um, and they've sort of said, you know, it, maybe we need to think a bit careful about what we look for in our CEOs and founders. Um, and in what sense? Like, as in what might they adjust? Do you uh, think? So I think um, we'll, we'll, we'll come on we'll to get into the findings after, after yeah. the break. But um, yeah. uh, I think the, the, the innovation is, you know, any CEO and founder, I think, will have a high innovation streak. So that's, that's probably no surprise in the results. Um, but I think it's the it's the point around taking risks and how you think about taking risks because any you know any innovation is a risk otherwise it's not an innovation right you just you just yeah, taking a product business and, and moving it that kind of one degree to the left but if you're going to say look we're going to you know not not have an old fashioned blood drop test that you use a piece of cardboard for we're going to uh, use a smartphone that's a you know that's a big step um and so i think they they want that risk but i think they, they want to be careful about how much risk that makes sense yeah that makes sense and um okay was there something else that would did we get through so w what was the this matters for the individuals i assume because it's good information that they should understand how they're going to be what they're going to be like how they how they work to interact with other people um, and I, th I think the, from an industry perspective, I think it's just acknowledging that, um, uh, and that you know, we've we've called the report necessarily different, which is say, actually, you know, in a in a regulated environment, you've got to be happy to break some rules. Um, so obviously not, you know, not not sort of ones that get you into medical trouble or risk patients, but if you go into this environment without thinking that way you're probably not going to come up with an innovative product that's really going to change patients' lives. Right. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, it's more around, I think, unless you're willing to, I, the, the way I like to put it is that if I'd have really known how hard it was going to be, 
really in detail i probably wouldn't you know that i wouldn't have necessarily i don't think i would have could have gotten the team together if that makes sense to to and gotten the mission together i think there's value in naivety sometimes where you know you have this big vision and you're working towards it and actually some level of comfort with the unknown and with taking a risk and the possibility of failure is obviously something you have to accept far more if you're in a kind of research and development heavy industry because a lot of research just fails a lot of stuff goes wrong you know there's that have you seen the amazing video about um musk and spacex there's like a video meme that did the round of like all of the um all of the r- missiles that crashed it was like one by one by one and they got gradually like one inch higher one inch higher one inch higher and they kept exploding or falling over and then gradually one gets up to 100 meters explodes and then you know and it's all set to the tune of gangster's paradise it's pretty funny <laughs> but it's um it's a pretty and inter- it's a pretty informative video right around yeah. um the development process when you're doing something new a lot of stuff breaks before you get it right yeah yeah and the risk um, is high yeah massive and i think that that plays back into how the investors have to look at it, how employees have to look at it, how the industry looks at it. It kind of all has to circle around. So to your point around the title of the the study being necessarily different, then yeah, I would agree that this industry has to be necessarily different. And maybe the people in it are. So on that note, we're going to go for our first commercial break. And then after the break, we're going to dig into the results of the survey um, with Ian Ian, Ian Coyne, my guest today, partner from Culture and Partners, who have just published uh, world first study, I believe, into the personality traits of digital health CEOs in the UK. We'll be back in two minutes. Hello, and welcome back to this week's Health Tech Hour with me, your host, Steve Roost, host of the Health Tech Hour and CEO of PopDoc, a UK based health tech business, Thank, uh, who also support the show. Uh, Ian, welcome back. Ian Coyne, partner at Culture and Partners. And let's dive straight in to the results of the necessarily different research study. So, Ian, over to you. Take it away. So I'll just cover um, methodology first. So, uh, like I said, we, we've we managed to get 50 CEOs and founders to complete a work styles and personality profile. Um, and the reason we kind of chose those two things is, you know, personality profile is, is how you... Uh, think and behave and then the work styles is then how that interacts with the people around you so they're the two things we looked at Um, and then once we had that data we've benchmarked it against um, Savile Wave which is the platform we use they have a C-suite benchmark so they said look you've got a cohort now 50 if we put them against that benchmark they score under or over Um, so rather than just saying oh you know you, you scored you know, highly on uh, new products and services, because that might be common in C-suite um, people. We've got a really nice um, differences data set. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I think that's a really key thing to pick up on, which is you've compared the individuals in this digital health cohort against other individuals outside of digital health to see if there's something specific. Yeah, something yeah. going wrong in our brains that means we're so passionate about this area, some some fault, some underlying genetic abnormality that means we do this every day. Yes, and there is. The good news is there is. That's always the thing. There's nothing worse than doing a bit of research and finding out there's no there's nothing there. Um, so no, there's there's um and the, the report has all the data in, but I think there's there's kind of four key findings that go nicely together to kind of build this necessarily different profile. Um, and the first one is, is unsurprisingly, if you look at kind of the, the top scores versus the C-suite, they're the kind of three big innovation scores. So building new products, changing organizations and creating new markets. So they are, I think, in the 90th and 95th percentile, or you are in the 90th and 95th percentile when it comes to innovation, which, which makes sense because early stage companies, you are really, you're trying to either create a market, change a, change a process, introduce something that's new um i guess the reason that that sort of was slightly surprising is because i think the the health system if you kind of put in its broader sense of of you know in our world nhs pharma medtech uh investors mm-hmm. um they're not geared up for innovation i think that's kind of fair. and that's not i i'm never critical of the nhs it's not you know an amazing um service to have but I think everyone who who tries to drive innovation through it knows it's it's not particularly geared up, and some of the stakeholders are not all aligned behind 
uh, you know, the, the need for innovation. So I think that's kind of what's great about that piece of data is it means that the data is probably right. When you find unsurprising data, I always think good. You know, you, yeah. you kind of got your your first um, your first set. So that, that's kind of finding number one. You know, kind of innovation is the natural preference for this cohort. That's good. Yeah, I think the um, that's a good thing because otherwise we'd be really struggling running innovative companies. Um, yeah, I'm not so surprised about that one, but I am. I, I, the point that you make around actually we're innovators or trying to innovate in a system which doesn't necessarily encourage free form innovation is a really interesting it's an interesting angle actually yeah and i always think about it like a little bit like if you um ever kind of take your kids bowling you know you have the bumpers that go up if you're terrible at bowling or like I oh yes i do <laughs> so like i always think of kind of innovation you know it, it's a little bit like that you've kind of got these bumpers everywhere in healthcare which is you know you have a brilliant um product and it's going to change the lives of people with, you know, chronic respiratory conditions, but there's no funding. So you, you ha it's like, OK, how do we get that? Because people can't necessarily always pay for this privately. So, um, yeah, I think it's kind of you're innovating in a world where, you know, there's a lot of kind of bumpers um, set aside. Um, yeah, I wonder whether I, think... that, I wonder that whether that just sort of makes us very kind of stubborn and pig headed, which is like we'll pursue innovation because we believe it's the right thing to do even if the system at that point doesn't necessarily value it. We just believe at some point that it will do. Which is finding two, which is like... Yes. <laughs> like, ah, like, ah, no. I didn't... That wasn't a setup, <laughs> I assure you. Um, so I think the the um, uh, the second thing, and, and you know, when I think about data, looking at individual data points is interesting, but when you put the data points together, I think it becomes a, a sort of more interesting picture. And if you look at what's called the leadership risks of this group, which is where um, they, you typically s spike together, mm -hmm. um, there's a combination of three risks, which I think speak to that point, Steve, which is um, these leaders tend to be highly autonomous. So again, I wouldn't say that's surprising. It's not uncommon for us to look for autonomous leaders when we're doing our work. Um, the second thing they are as well is, is daring. Mm -hmm. So that point around, Actually, I think there's kind of innovation and then there's during which is saying innovation, you can kind of see the path to and there's probably a degree of risk. But during is to say, you know, how do we do something that's actually quite radically different? Um, so you've got autonomy, you've got during. And the bit where I think it gets interesting is there's also a high degree of, of um, uh, being unpredictable. So and remember, this is an, a kind of an and equation. So it's, it's autonomous, yeah. during and unpredictable. Which kind of goes back to the like, point. Sounds like quite a mix. <laughs> well, exactly. Which goes back to my point before the break around building teams, because actually, you know, it, it's not. Um, I don't think that is a an unusual entrepreneurial profile, because you know, you and it's what we kind of call a follow me fast profile. So look, they're very. If you kind of dig beneath the data. These people are great communicators. They are great storytellers. They can build a narrative. Um, what they sometimes struggle to do is if you think about the sort of the the path they leave behind them is not always looking back and checking everyone's, you know, if you can imagine you're cutting through the jungle, is everyone still there yeah. or are they like the other side of the stream or falling off the cliff um, yeah. as you've gone long? Yeah, um, they've gone so, left at the fork and then, you know, someone else has gone gone right. Yes, yeah. Or, or don't have the equipment to follow you. You kind of, you know, you've got all of the yeah. kind of machetes and, and they're not able to follow. So, um so no, I think you've kind of got you know, high innovation and then this kind of interesting combination. And again, remember, the um, I'm always careful not to be critical of, of CEOs and founders. These are preferences. These are how they, you, they like to work. Um, that's not to say they can't work in another fashion. But again, going back to that point around pressure and um, kind of timing, you know, it's, it's a kind of well-documented uh, fact that under pressure, you have the extremes of personality profile coming out. So um, yeah. that that's kind of, I think, finding too is it's an interesting risk combination of how these people are naturally. Again, they are tend to be very smart people who can uh, adapt and learn. Um, but again, I think it makes it makes for an interesting leadership team dynamic. Yeah, I would agree with I would agree with all of those things. And I think it's a lot of that stuff, like you say, is probably universal across founders, entrepreneurs, you know, um, yeah. but some of that stuff around the unpredictable nature of it or, or even com being comfortable with uh, whereas if you start a marketplace just to go back 
if you have a product that people want, then it's a lot more predictable about whether you'll be successful or not. It's all comes down to numerical. Can I acquire customers at a cost that leaves me room for profit, for example? Yeah. It's, it's less around, well, how do I fit together all of the regulatory calculus with my R&D timeline and with my funding timeline and all of these different interlocking pieces that have to kind of fall into play where, you know, at any moment, something terrible could happen in your latest set of results that completely destroys everything that you've previously built. And a lot of that's outside of your control. Whereas I think in some other businesses, the success or failure is with much far, far more sequential and linear and um, within the control of the um, founding team or the team. But I don't know if you agree with that. Yeah, totally. And I think that's where the unpredictability point comes from, because if you, I remember speaking to a lot of med techs, probably at the peak of COVID, and they were saying, look, one of the biggest challenges they have, and I don't know if if you're affected by this, is when you go for European approval, um, you, you know, you set timelines for your device to be approved. And a lot of the European startups are telling us, look, the FDA, whilst being really expensive, is predictable. You have kind of service levels in terms of when you can submit, what you need to submit, and how long that will take to get an approval or, you know, feedback as to why your device might not be approved. A lot of people said, look, the European um, uh, approval mechanism is basically ground to a halt. Uh, And so you're then in a business where, to your point, Steve, you're growing a marketplace and you're just trying to, you know, you ramp up your customer acquisition it's kind of in your control. You know, you, you yeah. spend more money on marketing and, and customer acquisition and hopefully you get better lifetime value. If you had this kind of weird intermediary that said, look, you know, the European advertising agency won't, might not approve your spend on Google AdWords for yeah. four and a half months, you're kind of in limbo. So I think the... Well, well I mean, right now, if you look at it right now, um, we, I mean, I've been here in the of city market areas of up to two years. Yeah. Like, Okay, so what I mean, what how, do do you run, product, how do you run that company? I don't know how you do that. I mean, I know there are ways and means around it, but that's, I mean, you've got a fund that's a pretty big value of death to fund if that's the situation. Yes, yeah, and that's often I think where organizations pivot into you know, perhaps things like supporting clinical trials rather than trying to be supporting the NHS because, the you know, they, there's, a, there's a shorter route to market in a lot of those instances. Yeah, I think I think the NHS, working in the UK, it's extremely hard to escape the gravity well of the NHS Yeah, if you're a healthcare business. And, it, and it's a real double-edged sword because you want to work, for, but a lot of the reason I include myself in this, I would say most health tech, healthcare founders, CEOs that I meet got into it because they want to help the nhs you know and they believe passionately that what we do what they do can help but it can take a really long time and that forces you to then look into other business models which actually then may make it harder to work with the nhs because the nhs then may take a view about what you've gone on and done while you were waiting for them to do what you were waiting for them to do so it does become quite hard actually to deal with that and to try and put it all together yeah yeah and Going back to your point at the start, that the the reason we host the breakfast is actually just to build that ecosystem. So, you know, yeah. start, what starts as a as a kind of CEO and founder network, actually now we try and bring big pharma, med tech, um, NHS, uh, the the investors, some of the you know um, accelerators and incubators as well. So um, that that sort of ecosystem building is um, is really key. Agreed. What um, so what's next? What's the next one? So um, unsurprisingly, they are not um, great at building teams. So the C-suite average comes out about six out of 10. Um, yeah. the, this T, this group come out about 3.9. Um, so again, naturally, their approach is, um, again, it goes back to that kind of follow me fast approach. Um, so if, if you, again, generalizing 50 people into one, if you if you think about their management style, it's going to be very much driven through kind of... Um, you know, clear direction, tick in that box, clear communication, tick in that box. A bit about the how you get there, I think, is where it's not always natural for then these leaders to go down that, that level and say, great, as chief commercial officer or as CTO or as chief business officer, what I really need from you are these kind of four key deliverables this quarter. That that sort of level of granularity is not always there um it, it's not it's something to be learned it's something that um this this group you know is absolutely intellectually capable of picking up 
Um, however, going back to that default, the the sort of it is a you know a trailblazing you know with with kind of fire following them um, approach <laughs> <laughs> um, without okay. without necessarily <laughs> but so, sort of you know firefighting yeah. behind. <laughs> so, so on this one, I want to pick this up a little bit because I suspect, yeah. as it did for me, for many people that read this, this idea that we are in this cohort not natural team builders. I think probably came as a slight surprise, obviously. And I can't remember exactly where I came out, but it, I think this trend was relatively universal. And so I just kind of want to dig into it because in order to run a business, you have to build a team. Yes. In order to grow a business, you have to build a team. You have to keep it together. You have to keep people motivated. But that's not necessarily what we're, exactly what we're talking about here, is it? It's sort of, it's subtly different. Is it or is it the same thing? It is. No, I, I think I think it comes down to being highly structured about how you think about team. Because, um, okay. again, it, it's the if you look at the other areas in um, in that kind of cluster, you've got communication. Again, they score well above the C-suite and you've got what's called organizational commitment, which is enabling of people. So so if you think about that kind of, you know, uh, let's say 1990 Silicon Valley leadership model of, you know, get great people. Uh, you know, enable them and they'll make it happen. Slightly different in healthcare, I think, because there's, there are more, you know, bumpers. But I think it is that very structured thinking. And, and bear in mind, I think a lot of, you know, I think, Steve, you're probably an outlier. A lot of these founders are PhDs, doctors, you know, kind of very scientific thinkers that think about product innovation research in a certain way, but don't necessarily think about team building in in such a, you know, methodical yeah. and perhaps academic I, way I, I could think i could see that yeah i could see that um these guys have brought down the average um the um the, uh, <laughs> the, the uh, doctors yeah god dear um no i could see that because i think and I've, I've done quite a bit of work with technical founders and they've got a huge number of strengths whereas but that background doesn't necessarily lend itself it doesn't it's not an immediate overlap with how to grow a company I don't think, but 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 if they can combine it, then they become amazingly powerful individuals. I think because they have such a strong technical foundation that if they can combine some of the other bits to their to their sort of um, put that into their kind of um, feathers in their cap, so to speak, they become unbelievably powerful CEOs and leaders. Yeah. Um, so let's do let's do the last one, and then we can do the final break. And then we can come back and kind of keep talking about various different things. So I'm interested in kind of what happens after this, um, both on a personal level, but also, you know, on a kind of macro level. But what's the fourth and final kind of key learning here? Uh, so the, the the lowest score, so, you know, I think on the 75th percentile for this group is around what's called managed risk. Um, so so they this group are actually very, very open to, um, let's see, aggressive is the wrong word, uh, creatively managing risk, let's call it. So if you just go a level below that that measure, in the managed risk, you've got things like adherence to process and policies, building out standing operating, standard operating procedures. Um, and so I think what you've got, and again, this is the bit where kind of it's the lowest scoring in a massively regulated environment. This is the bit where I think this is the bit that's necessary. I think versus, you know, fintech and marketplaces and um, uh, consumer tech, yeah. I think you've got to go into this world thinking, I'm going to bend some of these rules and see how we go. Um, because, you know, I don't know, looking at kind of when you founded PocDoc, Steve, I don't know if even software as a medical device was a thing, right? Whether you can get software approved as a medical device, that's something that was relatively new. And I think a lot of companies mm. that went through it early were kind of writing the playbook alongside yeah. a lot of the regulators. So if if you're you know you're prepared to do that and say look I'm going to create something that I know is is doesn't have a way of being approved but I'm going to work with these perhaps slightly traditional risk averse regulators to make it approved that's a really big risk to to invent something you you are pretty sure right now is not something that would be allowed to go forward as a medical device yeah or um or like just be willing to throw everything in in the belief that it's ultimately the right solution and the regulatory framework will catch up. I think it kind of also brings up this really interesting idea. And I'm obviously these the stuff around Babylon, the kind of implosion there and other things that have happened around um, the kind of regulatory piece. 
um, with AI particularly and how far ahead generative AI is ahead of the regulatory structure, which, you know, I think is going to become a major issue ultimately for the industry at some point, if it isn't already. And the way that the regulatory frameworks, guidance, certification works, I cannot see how that generative AI is, is adopted at, at this point in time. And so it creates the situation where the founders of those companies either crack on anyway, or they immediately stop, which right. neither of which is a great option. I don't have a solution for it. Well, I've got some ideas, but <laughs> now's not the time. But, you know, I don't know if that kind of plays into what you're talking about a little bit. Yeah, and I think look, we need to give ourselves a medal for going 45 minutes on a podcast without mentioning generative AI. Uh, yeah, I know. It must be a record. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I think it does. And uh, you know, I also um, uh, have some views on generative AI. I think it's a, a great technology, but we'll probably you know, go into the AI technology playbook like most other things. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think in given it was kind of the lowest score across this cohort, I think it is one thing that that is a standout. And you know, as we build the data set up to 100 and 200, hopefully this will be validated as well. Is yeah. um, going into a highly highly regulated. And I think it's probably the same if you wound back the clock 10 years in fintech and said, you know, can you create a new bank that you know hasn't been created before and do it all online and not have branches? I think most people would have thought. You know, you're you're absolutely crazy yeah, to do mental, that. How do yeah. you pay in checks and cash and all these things that people thought were you know core to the the economy? Um, so yeah, I, th I think kind of you know just um, so if you put all that together, you've got you know deep innovation, a kind of autonomous but perhaps quite chaotic profile. Um, and again, remember we're talking about one person in perhaps a team of you know 10, 30, 50, yeah. however big the company is. Um, high degree of innovation, high degree of autonomy and slightly chaotic um, cloud around them. Um, it, it's not a natural disposition to them to build teams, but I think in this industry, they are prepared to take risks that means they can be successful. And I think actually they need to take those risks in order to be successful. Otherwise you'll end up in a, you know, with a product that is not differentiated enough and not um, worth a health system or a pharma company or regulator saying, we're going to make the investment to well, even this. if you get i mean even if you get to that point i mean i know the regulatory the regulatory side of things can be quite daunting um i think one of the things that we did very early on was well this was the first bit of money that we actually spent at the company was installing our own um, regulatory system regulatory framework um getting our iso 13485 certificate shout out to all of you qms nerds listening um the uh that was the first thing that we did and it was hugely daunting when you started a company and you want to go and talk about product development and all the exciting business development and commercial and all these other different things and actually you're kind of sitting there having to kind of deal with this regulatory framework and really try and get your head around all of these different components that fit into a quality management system but actually it stood us in a hugely good stead actually and i feel like the longer that you leave that and the, the further it goes without you engaging with it, the harder it ultimately becomes when you do. Um, but if you embed it as a strength in the business, then you start to learn. If you if you start to learn the intentions of the regulations and the regulators, and you, they're, they're humans, and the regulations were drafted by humans, and they have a purpose and a spirit, and a, and you can start to work with them and understand how to incorporate it into your business to deliver what you need to deliver. On the face of it, it could be very daunting and appear like it's black and white rarely although in some instances but rarely is it completely black or white in some of these instances a lot of it is really around particularly within a quality management system it's on you as a manufacturer to set up your standards and yeah. demonstrate you stick to your standards so a lot of it really boils down to again like how do you manage risk within your business and being comfortable having those discussions those debates turning the problem around trying different things um, which I, I which I, I can well believe isn't a common trait to have. Yeah, and I think you just you just articulate that last point there, Steve, which is, you know, there's a whole set of guidelines out there you need to follow as a medical device, and you've said, look, I'm going to set my bar here, wherever that you know, are, not too far below, but saying, look, this, these are our quality levels, and that's a risk. But you you basically look, I'm I'm prepared to take it, and also prepared to take the flack if it's you know too low or too high. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to go to the last break now. That that we that was a good discussion, and now um, we don't have that much time left in the show. So we're going to do the last commercial break, and then come back for the last little bit, 
with Ian Coin, partner at Culture and Partners, who have just published a groundbreaking piece of research into the personality types of digital health CEOs versus CEOs in the wider world. We'll be right back. Hello, and welcome back to the final part of this week's Health Tech Hour with me, your host, Steve Roost, and my guest this week, Ian Coyne, partner at Coulter and Partners. So, Ian, what is next with this research? What's going to happen next? Where does it go? What are you excited about? So, uh, just one um, open offer. So, like you have, Steve, any health tech CEO or founder listening now um, would love to have them in the program. Um, so, just reach out. You can find me on on. Um, LinkedIn primarily. Uh, so the, the deal is, uh, as you did, um, the CEO and founders can have a full um, development session with one of our leadership development specialists. In return, that data set goes, the anonymous aggregated data goes into our data set. Um, so that's just a shout out. So please do reach out. Um, I said, I think everyone I've spoken to said it's it's um, valuable and, and really interesting. Yeah, really exciting. I would emphasize to anyone who wants to do it, then they should reach out um, either to me or to Ian, and we can sort that out. We'll also, when we promote the show, Ian, we'll we'll, we'll put it into the post, so see if we can get right. you some more people. Thank you. Um, so I think what's next is so every um, every time we get to fifty people, we're going to republish, and I think what we'll try and do is at the moment it's a you know a, a PDF that's available on our website. We would like to get it onto a you know a bit more of a product platform, so people can kind of interrogate the data um, again as we split it between you know uh, founders i think one thing we we touched on just before the break around founders i think a lot of the incubators and accelerators that i work with insist on co-founders and i think that's because they often want to kind of bring um not just you know a single person as the leader of the business but try and bring a nice blend and often those co-founders they try and find you know if it's in a if it's in a sort of medical context a you know a CMO type and a CTO type yeah. to come together and, and bring real real complementary skills. Um, I also think I think I think that also makes sense. They just need to kind of not have all their eggs in one basket a little bit. And um, single founder businesses are unique in 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 the way that they operate. And you know you don't have quite the same checks and balances. And you know whether that's on a person personality level or a work level, you you it, it actually helps to have those in place. I believe, you know, it's a bit like why do you have a board? Well, you have a board to provide a plurality of opinions and approaches and advice, guidance, similar thing. Yeah, I think I'd I'd love to finish on a on a really, really positive note. Some constantly yeah. talked how hard this stuff is, um, uh, but I think there's there's massive massive glimmers of hope. Um, and actually, I'd like to go back to to 2016. Um, to so, uh, Steve, we, we've worked out you're not very good at bowling. Did you um, <laughs> did you ever play Pokemon Go? I did, yeah, I did play Pokemon Go. I did not as quite as as not as quite as avidly as some of my friends. My friend Andy used to love it, but I, I know what you mean, and it was it was an amazing product, brilliant yes, product. Yeah. And there's some great re health research been around done around Pokemon Go. So I think at its peak, Pokemon Go got about 28 million daily active users, which is which is huge for uh, the biggest app of the year. Um, and they looked at it, so you know they looked at the US market and said, what impact did Pokemon Go have on people's health? Um, and they said, look, they reckoned it added about um, uh, 144 million steps to the activity of US people in 2016. Um, <laughs> I love that. That's so good. Well, I'm not quite sure exactly what that says, but it's a great it's a great stat. Yes, but but if you, if you go below that and say, okay. It actually reduces reduced sedentary behavior of users by 30 minutes per day. So if you That's think about insane. all the kind of pushes in in the, the UK or you know health systems done around activity, like this is this is possible. Like changing health is massively possible, changing health through technology is massively possible. Um, so it increased exercise by 26% for the average players. Um, and then some of the the um, psychological benefits were um, it re reduced psychological distress, it improved connectivity, as in you know um, personal connectivity of players, but also imp improved cognitive ability in the teenagers that used it. So if you think about kind of all these health companies, you know we've got this kind of um, safety, you know it's a safety net absolutely, which is you know prescribing and, and medical interventions being primarily done by uh, you know doctors and professionals but if you kind of blend that world of of the kind of consumer behavior and tech i think you know there's there's a huge opportunity for tech to be part of improving 
overall health because if you think about the you know the rise of glp ones and azempic it's kind yeah. of you know to balance out the a lot of the you know that it's not political statements but a lot of the um uh, uh challenges are that you know poor foods are cheaper than you know eating well there's all yeah. these kind of structural challenges in society but you kind of go back to pokemon go and you know you can improve health through technology yeah. and we we um just as a side we know um we know now that we based on our preliminary data we know that in the two weeks after you do a pop doc test just by having done the test, doesn't matter what your results are, whether they were good, bad, or indifferent, we can track that your activity goes up. So every time you engage with that moment, because it's immediate, because you can see it, because you get the advice and it's associated with the test, you're prompted. And actually that has a downstream impact on your activity that lasts for about two weeks. S similar kind of concept to the Pokemon Go. Yes, yeah. And I think um, uh, I know... Um, uh, Kate, who I think is on on your one of your investors, and she said the same thing. People that engage in their health and their health data. So you know, it, I know that it's um, not particularly accessible, but you know, those people tend to be more healthy because they understand their health better. They can kind of understand the metrics around it. So you know, that that's kind of you know a, a sort of zero pharmaceutical intervention as well. So side effects, etc., don't even um, come into play. So that's why I think you know, kind of the the tech enablement of of any form of care and you know there's there's spectrums of complexity of that from you know just an app and around wellness and health all the way through to you know medical um interventions that are backed up by digital therapeutics it's the way the future's you know going to be in health i agree on that note i don't think there's any need for me to add anything on i think we've, we've that's a great way to end the show so ian thank you very much for coming on thanks for having me been a pleasure. Yeah, brilliant. And thanks to everyone for listening. We'll be back again next week. Have a great day.